I um, want to welcome you here today uh, to Stillwater's Church. If you are new to our church, we want to uh, encourage you today. We want to say thank you for being here with us. If you're new joining us online, we want to welcome you as well. One of the big statements that we say here at this church is that your next step is your most important step. And we believe that is true in the Christian life. The idea being uh, that you are continuously growing, that God is never finished with you yet. You still breathing? God's not done with you yet. That's good news, right? No matter what, your next step is your most important step. So in your relationship with God, that is a very important thing to think about. Um, if you're new, we have a next step card, and you can fill that out at the end of the service and drop it in the offering uh, if you don't mind. Um, maybe next steps for you would be getting involved. A lot of people get busy during the year. A lot of people get, um, they just get their attention somewhere else, not on purpose. They don't really intend to drift, if I, if I can use that kind of language, but it's just accidental. They just, uh, they, they lose focus. So maybe for you this year, your next step would to be get your focus back on the Lord. Maybe your next step would be to be involved in prayer. We have our uh, prayer ministry this next year. We're going to be ramping things up in prayer. We've got prayer at noon on Wednesday. I'm going to start back our pastor's prayer partners uh, this year. And uh, I'm going to really be emphasizing prayer at the end of our services uh, this next year. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. So maybe you'd like to be involved in that. Or maybe uh, your next step is just to become more faithful. Next Sunday, uh, I'm very excited uh, for, uh, for all of us that will be here next Sunday. We have our regular service next Sunday at 1030, the last Sunday of the year. And uh, Jose Dolagaray, one of our deacons, uh, is going to be speaking for us next year. Now, talking about next steps... Um, Jose has been coming, he and his family have been coming here for a very long time, and um, we went on a missions trip back in August down to the Dominican Republic, and uh, Jose wasn't planning on doing this, but the people leading there asked him to speak at a church. He'd never done it before. He was like, what? You want me, all these pastors here, you want me to do this? Well, God knew exactly what he was doing, and God used him in a great way. And uh, he is going to be bringing a little slightly different version of that message next Sunday. And I say slightly different version because he spoke that message in Spanish. And uh, unless you speak Spanish, you wouldn't understand it. But he has got a great message. And so there are a lot of things. Then the first Sunday of the year, maybe talking about next steps, you want to invite more people next year. Take one of the invite cards Next, uh, the, not this next Sunday, but the first Sunday of January, we have an evangelistic Sunday. I've told you about our guest speaker that's coming in, and he's going to be sharing his life. He's going to be sharing hope. He's going to share how that God radically changed his life after his wife prayed for him for 35 years. This is going to be a wonderful opportunity for you to bring people that don't know Jesus or that need hope or that believe maybe that God's done with them yet, uh, or that maybe they don't think that there's anything left for them to do, that God's finished with them, man, you need to get them here. It's going to be great. And then, of course, we start a brand new series on January the 14th uh, called The Power to Change. And I'm going to be talking about, we all like change in the new year, right? Uh, but I'm going to talk about how God has put in you the power to change. Not through your own ability, not through your own strength, but through the Holy Spirit of God. And we're going to be talking about that for about six weeks. And then on the 21st of January, we've got uh, a gathering after the service potluck for anybody that wants to come, uh, talk about some vision and things that we're going to be doing. I promise you, you don't want to miss it. Uh, you say, well, I'm not that interested in vision. You are interested in good food that some of these people are going to bring, Okay. I can promise you that. I don't know what it is about church, but it seems like almost everything at church, is, it's kind of around food, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's because Christian women are such good cooks. 
Um, or maybe it's Southern women. I don't know. Um, but um, anyway, I hope you'll be a part of that. Take your next step. Now, speaking of next step, I'm going to do something a little unusual today. And I, I promise you, I've got a message I'm going to give you. Um, but as I was thinking about what our church needs, where we're going, what our next step is as a church. A lot of things I was thinking about, but one of the things I was thinking about was prayer. And one of the things that I asked God to do a few years ago was to allow us as a church to be able to minister to people in need, especially that are in physical need. In other words, we want to pray for people to be healed. Now, I guess it's easy to get caught up in the thought that, well, we want to pray for people with cancer, and we do. Or we want to pray for people with heart disease, and we do. Or we want to pray for people that are going through surgery, and we do. But you know, um, in Isaiah, it says, with his stripes we are healed. And Jesus clarified that in the Gospel of Matthew. He talked about that he bore our sicknesses on his body. So the idea is not just spiritual in nature, that God will forgive your sins and bear your illnesses or your sins, But that physically as well, Jesus, when he came to this world, became human, the God-man, and what he did was he became the one who was able to heal. Now, God was able to heal in the Old Testament. There was a name of God called Jehovah Rapha, which means I am the Lord who heals. But Jesus made it very personal in the New Testament when he came to this earth. So anyway, I was just thinking about that, that, you know... Uh, duh, me, I'm saying, God, uh, you know, use us, help us. And I'm not emphasizing it enough. And this next year, here's what I want to really emphasize. If you've got a headache, you can pray. If you've got a cold, you can pray. If you've got a problem with cramps in your legs at night, like my dad does, you can pray. And and the point being is that God is the one who heals. Now, does God use doctors and medicine? Of course he does. But make no mistake, doctors don't heal. God heals. Now, God uses doctors. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against doctors. I went to a doctor recently. Uh, And so I was thinking about this, and I've just got a little repentance to do You know what the word repentance means, right? It means to agree with God. It means to change your thinking. And as I was thinking about, and I was asking people to pray for me, because I've been sick for about three weeks, as many of you know, and um, I'm thinking to myself, here I am saying to our church, we want you to pray for, and have the elders of the church pray for you, and yet, duh, as the pastor, I didn't even have the elders pray for me. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Not all of our elders are here today. Some of them are out of town, but I'm going to ask the elders that are here. I know Matt and Will are here. I don't know if I can see anybody else, but would you guys come to the stage for me real quick? Uh, And um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have them pray for me, all right? Now, here's what the Bible says in James 5. It says, if any are sick, let the elders of the church come and pray. And it says that the prayer of faith will heal the sick. And so that's what we're going to do today. I'm not going to lead it. I'm going to ask Will, would you uh, just, you guys, if you would. And I'm doing this, once again, as an example. I'm doing this to show that no matter what it is, you can pray over it. No matter how small it may be, no matter how big it may be, God cares for you. Okay? You need to understand that. Particularly during this season, for a lot of people, you get discouraged, depressed because of all the busyness that goes on during this season. God knows you, he cares for you, and he loves you. And so I'm going to ask these guys, if they don't mind, to pray for me uh, at this time. Will, if you would lead us, you can use this mic here, if you will. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, Lord, this is the man of God. This is your man, Lord. This is our leader, Lord, that comes before us, Lord, whenever we need him whether we're in service or whether we're at home. He's reliable. We can count on him. And most of all, he loves you. He has a heart for people. I know, God, he's been going through. 
But Lord, you're a healer. You mm. are a deliverer. Amen. And Lord, I'm asking you in Jesus' name to touch him in his body right now. From the very crown of his head to the sole of his feet. That whatever that issue is, we demand that it dry up, that it leave his body. Amen. Give him that strength. Give him that courage to lead his flock, Lord. Your flock in the name of Jesus. God, Pastor Ricky, miss him. Bless his entire family over the holidays, Lord. Continue to help them right now to go forward. Regardless of what may come or what may go, Lord, you are in control. And we ask you, Lord, just to give him strength. Give him strength and courage today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. All right, well, let's get down to the message. I know I've talked a lot, and uh, hopefully it's been something that will challenge you. But we've been in this series uh, called The Name, and it's been taking for, taken from Isaiah chapter 9, where it talks about Jesus, and it talks about four of his names. He's wonderful counselor. He's mighty God. He's everlasting father. And today I'm going to talk about the last of these names. He is the prince of peace. Man, when you think about Christmas, it just seems like peace should go along with it, doesn't it? Peace is one of the most important qualities we need as humans. I want you to think about that. We desire peace in the world around us. Think about the unrest that's been going on in our world uh, the past few months. I think about the Russia-Ukraine war, the Israeli-Hamas war. These are things that have caused not peace, but war. Not peace, but chaos. And yet, in our life, we need peace, whether you're in a war or whether it's just in your own personal life. A lack of peace brings destruction in the world around us. I cannot imagine what it would be like to wake up every day in a war zone, worried about a bomb going off, worried about whether you're going to make it through the day or not. Worried about whether your kids are going to get fed or not. Can you imagine the emotional turmoil that that causes? Peace is very important. A lack of peace brings destruction, but we also desire peace in our personal life. Um, you can be devastated through a lack of peace that comes from the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, a loss of resources. And we've seen people go through these things, and, and they become so um, filled with chaos and pain and uncertainty, and they have no peace. Sometimes, unless we know how to have peace in a storm, it can cause great damage to our lives emotionally. And notice what I said. Anybody can have peace when everything's going well. Got lots of money in the bank, jobs, a piece of cake, your kids wake up every morning and serve you coffee and clean their rooms. Oh, we're talking about reality here, okay. But the fact is, in your personal life, you can have a lack of peace. And until you learn how to have peace in the middle of a storm, you really don't have peace. You really don't have peace until you learn how to put your trust in Jesus in the storm. Now, I love the fact that Jesus is called Prince of Peace. He is the prince, the king, the ruler, the controller, the giver of peace. That's who he is. He is the king of shalom. Shalom is a wholeness, a flourishing, a rhythm of living that deals with all aspects of our life. It is a complete peace. In every area, it's peace physically, it's peace spiritually, it's peace emotionally, it is peace in every area of your life. And I ask you this question, do you have peace? Particularly as it relates to your relationship with God. One of the things I love about what the angels did when they announced the birth of Jesus, listen to what it said in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. If they said, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Seems like we have a lack of peace, doesn't it? Seems like we have a lack of goodwill. Especially, have you ever noticed that like through social media, people, they don't have the, 
They don't have the filter of like, you know, seeing a person face to face and saying something to them. So they'll say whatever they feel like on social media. Anybody ever notice that? Uh, anybody besides me not get on social media because of that kind of stuff? <laughs> Thank God I don't do it very often. But my point is this. Jesus came to bring peace. And the culmination of everything that Jesus came to do, I believe, can be summed up when Jesus is the prince of peace. He, he came to bring peace. Jesus came to embody what peace is and what it represents. And on this Christmas Eve, I'm going to read from Isaiah once again. And we're going to talk about the name that was given to Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, for to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given. His humanity, the fact that he was the son of man, or in other words, he was the Messiah, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. He's going to rule one day. He's coming again. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counsel. We talked about how wonderful Jesus is. He's wonderful in his ways. He's wonderful in his counsel. He is the mighty God. There's nothing too hard for him. Aren't you glad that there is nothing impossible with God? He is the everlasting father. He's never going to let you down. And then he is the prince of peace. And then it says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. That last sentence simply means that God is very passionate about reaching people. He is very passionate about putting us in right standing with him. He is very passionate about you. The zeal of the Lord of hosts. He never gets tired of saving sinners. You say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a sinner. Well, the good news is Jesus came to save sinners. You say, well, I've been, I've been kind of bad. I've heard people say, boy, if I were to walk into that church, the roof would fall in. You know, Jesus specializes in reaching people like that. The fact is the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. I just want to give you very simply and very quickly three simple thoughts about Jesus being the Prince of Peace. Number one, Jesus came to bring authentic peace. Authentic peace. You know, a lot of times we seek peace in things that don't really give peace. You ever notice that? Um, they make promises, but they don't deliver. Think about the many things that we're tempted to trust for in peace that were never designed to give real and lasting peace. Uh, one big one is money. Now, now, let me ask you a question. How many have ever fantasized, and be honest, you're in church, how many have ever fantasized about what you would do if you won one of those $500 million lotteries? Raise your hand. I, I'm, I'm, I fantasize about it, okay? Now, I've heard people say this a lot. Well, I tell you, if I won that, we'd take care of all the stuff that the church needs. Well, I would challenge your thinking. If you don't give on what you've got now, you wouldn't give if you had $500 million in the bank. Okay? Now, now, now listen. The point is this. Money, we think, brings peace. Now, there's nothing wrong with having money. And certainly, a lack of money doesn't bring peace. I'm not suggesting that. I mean, if you're worried about paying your power bill and you're worried about your car being repossessed, I'm not suggesting that it's peaceful. But the fact is, when we trust in money and possessions to bring lasting peace, they always fail. Here, think about this. Money cannot give you a longer life. You cannot buy one more second of life. You can be the wealthiest man in the world, the wealthiest woman in the world, and you cannot buy another year of life. It just doesn't happen that way. Money doesn't prolong our life. Uh, it can't give you better health. It can't keep your kids from hating you. Think about that. I mean, the truth is, uh, you 
often think that, boy, if we just have more money, then all my relationship problems will be solved. Really? You ever hear of rich people getting divorced? Okay. The truth is, money does not bring peace. Okay. And I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't have money. In fact, if I have a choice between having a little money and a lot of money, I'm going to choose a lot of money. All right. So the fact is, though, it does not bring peace. If that's what you're trusting for your peace. We think our reputation brings lasting peace. Speaking of social media, no number of likes or followers or adoring fans brings true peace. It just doesn't happen. It's not your reputation is not what brings peace. We think that our relationships bring peace. Often they bring chaos. Relationships are important, but how many failed marriages does it take for us to realize that relationships are not the answer? They're important. We all should have relationships, but how many counterfeit gods can we pursue before we really realize that those things are not the answer? They are not the source of peace. No matter how much money you have, no matter how great your reputation is, no matter how many relationships you have, no matter how much success you have, no matter how great of a career you have, these are not the answer. Now, I'm going to tell you a story from the book of Genesis that illustrates what I'm talking about. I think it may be one of the greatest illustrations of how you and I can trust Jesus to bring peace versus our secular life to bring peace. The story is found in the book of Genesis, and I'm going to set it up for you. Abram, he was later called Abraham, but before God changed his name, he was called Abram. Now, God had made a promise to Abram that an heir would come through his children. Now, the problem was Abraham, Abram didn't have any children yet. He was 90. His wife was 80. They had no kids And God said, oh, I'm going to give you some kids. Now, I don't know if there are any 80-year-olds in here or not, but I don't imagine you'd be very excited about getting pregnant at 80 years of age. (laughs) Truth is, she had a baby when she was 90, 90 years old. Now, I I got to meet all four of my great-grandmas. All of them lived into their 90s, okay? And when I think about a 90-year-old great-grandma having a baby, it kind of creeps me out, all right? So just be honest, all right? Uh, one great-grandmother, uh, her name was uh, Granny Wagner. Uh, I'll never forget going to her house, and this was back years ago. She had a life-size poster of Tom Selleck on her door. She was in her 90s. And I looked at her, I said, Granny, why have you got a life-size poster of Tom Selleck on your door? She looked at me. She said, she had snuff in her lip, you know. She said, son, she said, I might be old, but I ain't dead. <laughs> well, God had promised Abram and Sarah that they were going to have a child. And he had promised that through this child that hope for the entire world would come. Okay, so you got that? Uh, he, he's, he's got this promise. He's following God. Now, if you read in the book of Genesis, Lot was Abram's nephew. And they moved to this new area. And Lot moved into a city called Sodom. You've heard of Sodom and Gomorrah, okay? Sodom represents that worldly lifestyle. It represents uh, what is not spiritual, what is not of God. And Lot, even though the Bible says he was a righteous man, the Bible says that he vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their deeds. In other words, he was living amongst a bunch of people that just didn't love God, that didn't serve God, that had no uh, point of having, they had no plan of having a relationship with God. Well, as it happened, uh, several nearby kings, okay, giving you a little bit of history here, several nearby kings, there was king of Sodom, And there were several nearby kings that attacked, and they captured Abram's nephew and his family, Lot, okay? That was his name. Now, when Abram heard about it, he was furious. And talking about a great man, um, there were several kings that had attacked 
Sodom and taken Lot. And Abram, just with his own men, his own hired help, his own servants, the Bible says it's like 300 and something of them, and they've been trained for war, he goes and he defeats several kings by himself. And he rescues Lot, and he brings them back. Now, here's where we pick up the story of what had happened. Because when he came back, the king of Sodom and the king of Salem, I'm going to explain that in a minute. The king of Sodom, representing the world, the king of Salem, the word Salem means peace, the king of peace. And the Bible calls this man's name Melchizedek. So get the picture. Abraham had gone and rescued his nephew and their family, got a great victory, defeated several kings by himself, and he's coming back home, and the king of Sodom and the king of Salem come out to meet him. And so we're going to pick up uh, who Melchizedek was. By the way, you can believe what you want, but I believe that Melchizedek was an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. You say, why do you believe that? Well, let me read to you from the book of Hebrews. It says, talking about Melchizedek, he is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. Sounds like Jesus to me. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. Sounds like the prince of peace to me. He is without father or mother or genealogy. In other words, he is eternal. I don't know of an earthly person that is that way. Sounds like Jesus to me. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues as a priest forever. Now, you can believe what you want, okay? But that seems pretty clear to me that that was Jesus, okay? So here's you got the, the picture. The king of Salem, Jesus, the king of peace, the king of righteousness, and the king of Sodom, uh, the king of this world, of trusting in yourself, not trusting in God. So pick up with me in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 17. And after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Just another picture of who Jesus is. What is Jesus in communion uh, when he tells us uh, that we are to partake of his body and his blood? What does that mean? The wine and the bread. Guess what Melchizedek brought? He brought salvation. He brought the elements to worship God. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of, the, of God Most High, and he blessed him. The interesting thing is, as you're going to see, is that Melchizedek brought a blessing. The king of Sodom brought a demand. Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram, notice the worship, gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me. Not The sentence goes on, but I ended it right there. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give me. What did Melchizedek say? You're blessed. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your family. Blessed be God most high. Blessed be your worship. Blessed be your relationship with the heavenly father. He didn't make demands. He brought gifts. The king of Sodom, however, said, give me. Uh, and I love this. Uh, Jesus brought the body and the blood. He brought blessing. He brought deliverance. And he brought peace with God. Now, once again, we're talking about authentic peace. Jesus brings authentic peace. He alone is able to bring that. What did the king of Sodom bring? He brought demands. And if you seek peace in anything other than in Jesus Christ, you're going to be just like that king of Sodom and have nothing but demands placed on you. 
demands for more money, demands for more time, demands for getting better. I mean, we could just go on and on. But when you come to Jesus, he brings peace. Well, here's the second thing, the second thing and it's not going to be very long. Uh, Jesus came to bring an advancing peace. He brings authentic peace but also an advancing peace. It says of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Aren't you glad that the kingdom of God is an advancing kingdom? There is more grace available. There's more peace available. God is working to bring people peace and to bring many into his family. Don't miss that this Christmas. This Christmas is not just about music and food and family and gatherings. Those are wonderful things. But this Christmas... Make it about the advancing peace that God has in our life. He advances his kingdom. He wants to bring you an authentic peace with the Father, and he loves you, and it's never too late for you. That's good news, isn't it? No matter how late it is in the season for you, and I would suspect with this number of people in the room that there are some that maybe you didn't get all your Christmas shopping done yet, and you're under stress. Just let... Jesus advance the peace in your life, understanding that he alone is able to give peace. And then stop by and get Walmart and get a gift card. Okay, that, that'll, that'll work. All right, so. And then finally, here's the third thing. Jesus came to give authentic peace and advancing peace, but thankfully, he came to give an abiding peace, one that never ends. It lasts. He gives eternal peace with God, Isaiah 2, 4, and he shall judge among the nations. Notice this. I love this. He's talking about in heaven. He's talking about when Jesus comes to rule and reign. Listen to what he said. And he shall judge among the nations, and he shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Oh, isn't that going to be a glorious day? Jesus gives an abiding peace. He gives a peace that is eternal. And so the question as we end this series today is simply this. Have you made peace? with the Prince of Peace. Now, maybe today you're here and you'd say, Pastor, I've never received Christ, or I'm not sure about that, or I don't really know. Well, the good news is that Jesus offers peace if you'll ask. That's the wonderful thing. You don't have to earn it. In fact, you can't earn it. All you do is receive it as God's free gift. The Bible tells us in Galatians that it, is a, 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 that it is a free gift. In Ephesians, sorry. It is a free gift. You can't earn it. You know why? We brag about it. Oh, yeah, look how good I am. I earned a spot in heaven. That's how good I am. God says, no, you're, you're not that good. Okay, you may think you're good, but you're not that good. He said, so receive this free gift of salvation. For those of you online and those of you in the room, listen closely. We give people opportunities, we try to do this every week, to receive Christ. Now, maybe you're new to church, maybe you haven't grown up in church, or maybe you're not even familiar with what all that means. Well, it means this, that you understand that you need a Savior. It means that you understand that by your own self, you're not good enough to go to heaven. You know what that causes us to react a little bit? You ever notice that we all think we're better than we actually are? We all think, oh, I'm good. No, yeah, if I were to weigh the good against the bad, I'd go to heaven. Surely, I'm surely not going to go to hell, right? And we all think that. But until you're willing to admit that you need a Savior, that's why Jesus said in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, the very first thing, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. That word poor in spirit means absolutely broken. It's not that you need uh, a payday loan. It's not that you need a lower interest rate. It's not that you got a piece of junk car and you can't afford a new one. Not that kind of poor. The kind of poor that is absolutely abject. And unless somebody steps in, you'll die. 
That's what that word means. And, and until we recognize that apart from God, we can't do this on our own, poor in spirit, admitting that I need Jesus, admitting that I need peace with God. The Bible says that the way you do that, you just simply ask. So maybe in the room today, you would end our service with this today, that you would ask Jesus to save you. Pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I ask that you forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and resurrected from the grave. And I receive your forgiveness. And I'm asking you for the peace that only you can give. In Jesus' name, amen.